the point that everybody should try to take away from this, you know, very informal conversation is prepare now. Now is the time. The Vedas have a statement. Now is the time to inquire into the absolute truth. You have a human form of life now. You may not have it again. Who knows for how long, you know. So we should use it for what it's intended for. That's the whole purpose of the human form of life. See, spiritual realization. That's the purpose of the human form of life. Hi, and welcome to the Breaking Trail podcast, where you learn to navigate life's journey through ancient wisdom. This is Ruben, and in today's talk, me and Balakia speak about the meaning of death, if there is such a thing as surviving death, and also about Balakia's experiences with his parents leaving this world. So uh, I'd strongly encourage you to uh, listen with an open mind and buckle up and get ready for some truth. Yes, 70% of people have never had a conversation about death. and. Uh, but 60% 60 of the people think that there should be such a conversation. Um, yeah, so... That's staggering. That's, that's, to me, that's like amazing. <laughs> <clears throat> but again, at the same time, I'm not surprised. Why, why is that? <laughs> why, why is it that we fear so much to talk about this topic? Well, because denial is a very, very common method to make it so you don't have to think deeply. You don't have to consider things that you can't tangibly prove or touch or feel. And also, when you talk about God, now you're opening up a whole concept of religion. And in many people's mind, religion is a bad thing. It's restrictive, it's oppressive, you know, and, and they'll use all kinds of historical events to prove that religion is bad, whether it's the, you know, crusades led by the Christians, you know, long, long ago, or, you know, they look at countries where there's obvious uh, domination or, or the presence of religion in society like the Middle East, you know, with their uh, belief in Islam. And they see all kinds of conflict there. You know, one country, Muslim country, fighting another Muslim country, you know, because one is one branch of Islam and another is another branch of Islam. One is Sunnis, one is Shiites, one what? In other words, they use that as a justification you know, show me the good that religion has done when I can show you many examples of where it's been a negative rather than a positive, you know. And I also will, will look at where religion is a part of a person or people's lives. There's a lot of judgmental attitudes toward other religions or people who aren't, you know, in the same camp or on the same team as they are, you know, and there's always associated with the religion in people's minds a lot of fear, you know, because people are doing what their religion tells they should do because they're afraid not to, because if they don't act correctly, they're going to suffer big time, you know, maybe they'll suffer from ostra, uh, what do you call ostracism, you know, ostracism or criticism yeah. now, you know, or seen as, as lower or outcast or whatever. But the big fear is after death, then they're going to meet hell, you know. They're going to meet some real big, you know, painful ter turmoil, uh, tor torture, whatever you know, burning, and so there's a lot of fear involved, you know. There's one place in America where I, I visit, you know, when I'm in America, I, I either visit there or I drive through there, and there's big billboards on the side of the road put up by some, 
uh, religious people. They said, when you die, are you going to go to heaven or hell? You know, and, you know, people see that kind of stuff and they just go, I don't want anything to do with this subject. Because, you know, it's just not comfortable for me. There's no part of this whole thing that's comfortable. And people like to be comfortable. So if they just deny the whole thing, let's don't talk about that, see. Then, you know, there's a certain level of comfort there. And will they say never talk about religion or politics? Because either one of those subjects will lead to, you know, you know, quarrels or debates or arguments or whatever. So let's just don't go there, you know. Let's just avoid that whole un unpleasant experience. So you, you prefer to be, uh, you're saying basically that our fear for religion is, is greater than our fear of death because that's a choice we have, right? We, we can either, you know. Yeah, and they can't, nobody, let's say like this, one of their main, you know, arguments is you can't prove any of the things you're telling me. You're quoting me something from a book, whether it's the Bible or Quran or Bhagavad Gita or whatever, but I don't know that that's true, and you don't either. You know, you just believe on faith. So how do I even know after, you know, I leave this body, or they don't even know that, just after I die, that there's anything, you know? Who says there's anything? Who can prove it? So better to just don't even think about it, don't talk about it, live your life to the fullest, enjoy now while we can, and then when we die, we die. And that's and whatever, happens, whatever happens. happens. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, that's it. It's over. And other people think, well, I'll deal with that when I get to it. You know, I'm not going to spend my whole life in anxiety now worrying about that. And, you know, also a lot of the pro people who are promoting religions are fanatics. You know, and so when you, you meet a fanatic, you know, it's not a comfortable experience either. And they're pushing you to join their team or read their books or, you know, they're promising you, you know, hell and damnation if you don't. Or they're just not, they're not, not comfortable people to be around. So, again... They just rather just say, well, don't even talk about that stuff. So 70% of the people, whatever you said, they just don't have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then also the teachings of religion, you know, as, as they see it, will restrict them in their enjoying life. You know, oh, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't have illicit sex, you can't do this, you can't do that, this is bad, that's sinful, and so on. And society today, more than before, is based on those activities of pleasure. And people have, you know, invested their whole life in experiencing those pleasures. And therefore, if, if they have to be told that, well, you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that, or if you do that, you're going to suffer, you know, in other words, hedonism is not allowed, then, again, don't talk to me about that stuff. I don't want to hear that. So from many, many angles, it's uncomfortable for people to be confronted with religions and their teachings. And, and that's funny because you have lived, uh, for those who maybe not know you, you've lived a yoga lifestyle for more than 50 years now, and your own YouTube channel is called Happy Man. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you don't seem to be on a big bummer. Well, that's because all the things I've described are, which are, you know, in the eyes of people, negatives, are actually, many of them are not true. Many of the beliefs they have aren't really correct. You know, or they've been told things that aren't correct. And 
they just don't have education. You know, even the people that are promoting different, quote, religions or teachings or belief systems or whatever, unfortunately have very little understanding themselves. And so, therefore, you know, <clears throat> without knowledge in any category, you can't get the, the fullest benefit from, the, from that category or subject or whatever it is. But in the yoga teachings, you know, number one, it's if it's f done correctly, I mean, I'm not saying it's always like that, unfortunately, but a true yoga teacher, number one, he's not a fanatic. Number one, he has very, very good grasp of the subject. He understands it. And along with that, he has real compassion and care for the people. And he wants to help them, and so he presents the true yoga knowledge to them in such a way that they can experience, number one, this guy really cares about me. Number two, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. They just understand that. They have a feeling about that. And number three, wow, this sounds good, you know, because a lot of people know the life they're leading now is not the best life. You know, they're trying to make it better than it ever could be. But they know inside, you know, I'm still not satisfied. I'm a little, you know, lonely or depressed or empty or maybe I'm, a, I'm in that category on a large scale. Maybe I'm totally depressed and contemplating suicide. So they know there's they need something else. But when they look at it, other alternative, which is all the religions as, you know, they're often presented, that doesn't look like a good choice either, you know. So they're kind of stuck. Well, where do I go, you know? So a lot of people just go down into lower and lower levels of voidism, you know, just void out, you know, increase the intoxication, increase the denial, you know, increase the hedonism, you know, and, and just cover it all up with false pleasures that actually are destroying a person from the inside until ultimately it kills people. I mean, actually, <laughs> kills people. That's why people commit suicide, you know, because they, they've just reached the point where there's no reason to live. So it's unfortunate that that's the way it is, but um, that's, that is reality, you know. Whereas in a yoga teaching... We start at ground zero, you know. We take it from a place where people, okay, you don't know anything about life. So let's begin to build your knowledge. Let's begin to uh, present a system that will educate you hmm, gradually. So you have to start educating people. You're not the material body, you know. So, so that's... Uh... Because I, I had, a, you know, when you, when you say that, uh, I read that when Socrates was about to be executed, uh, one of his students, Crito, asked him, you know, but how are we going to bury you? He was, he was worried about how to bury his, his master, Socrates. And Socrates replied, however you like, provided you can catch me and prevent my escaping you. Yeah. <laughs> catch me if you can. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that's reality, you know. People think they're the body, you know, and we're not. So right there, you've got the beginning or the root cause of the problem of life. I don't know who I am. If I don't know who I am, what do I know? And how can I know what to do with myself if I don't know who I am? In other words... The, the darkness of ignorance eclipses the light of knowledge. And, and therefore, we're walking around in the dark. And everybody that's been lost in the dark knows it's a difficult life. You know, you bump into things, you trip over things, you go the wrong way, you make the wrong decisions. You know, fear is in darkness because you can't see what's going on. You know, the boogeyman lives in the darkness, right? You know, little kids wake up in the night and they're afraid of the boogeyman 
it's dark and he's hiding in the closet or he's under the bed or whatever. But when the light's on, you know, it's, oh, there's no boogeyman, <laughs> you know. So this is this is unfortunate, but on a, a psychological scale, you know, when we're in the darkness of ignorance, you know, life is very fearsome, very difficult, uh, very, you know, unknown, and on and on it goes, you know. And to live like that is not normal. So again, in the Vedic teaching, which is the, the root of the yoga teaching, uh, it's clearly presented that we're not our material body. We're in a whole different category of energy. See, everything is energy, and there's a lot of, you know, interest in energy right now. You know, has been for, you know, since the 60s. You know, feel the energy. You know, let's let's feel the vibes, man. Like it's it's stuff going on here. You know, but everything is energy. You know, there's a different energy in a dead tree than a live tree, you know, or a dead human and a live human. You can feel there's there's a missing something here. There's there's some energy missing. You know, so the two categories of energy are material energy and spiritual energy. And our bodies are material energy. You know, and basically we we learn we have two bodies, believe it or not. We've got the physical body. But we also have a mental body, you know, and that's called the psychic body or, you know, in esoteric circles, it's known as the astral body. And that's where all the drama really takes place. You know, that's where the depression is and that's where the fear is. And, you know, your hand's not afraid. It's the guy behind the hand that's afraid, you know, and... So the, the psychic body, which is still material energy, but of a subtler nature, is, is, you know, really a big player in our experience of life. But <clears throat> underneath that is the true person, the, the true self, which is who we are, spirit, the spirit soul. Tiny sparks, tiny infinitesimal you know, atomic in size sparks of spiritual energy, you know. So like I say, you've got a, a live body and a dead body. Or let's say you're with a person and, you know, they're in a dire situation. But that person's still there. There's an energy there. There's life there. And then that person leaves that body, you know, that spiritual spark leaves that body. And immediately, that energy, which was life and you experienced, is gone. And so you can look at a dead body and almost without checking pulse and, you know, all those things, you can know this guy's dead. You know, there's nobody here. I remember one time in Los Angeles, I was early morning, I was driving, it was basically on the street I was on, there was no traffic and... There was a grass medium on the right side and then a chain link fence, which encircled a storage facility. And I saw, you know, this person laying on that lawn. And it was a slope and the feet were down, the head was up. And as I got closer, I could see it was a female. And, you know, then I could, blonde hair, you know, and kind of disarrayed and just laying there. And I got out and went over and I knew right away this this woman's dead, you know. And it wasn't like she was mutilated, blood all over anything. I just looked at her and I went, she's dead, you know. And she was. Somebody had killed her, you know, close examination showed there was a little wound in her chest. Somebody had stabbed her or whatever, I don't know. And uh, And she wasn't there. So she was attractive, physically speaking, but it wasn't attractive. There was no attraction there. Her clothes were a little disarrayed. Her breasts were a little revealed. But there was no attraction there because it was a dead body, you know. So there's a whole different energy between spiritual energy and material energy, you know. And that's who we are. We're not attracted to dead bodies. We're attracted to live bodies, which means we're not really attracted to the body. We're attracted to the person in the body, you see. 
And that person's energy and that person's personality and that person's radiance and et cetera is what we're attracted to. And if it's wrapped in an attractive kit, you see a proactive wrapper, you know, the, the blonde hair, the blue eyes and the shapely form and all that, so much the better, you know. But when the person leaves, that whole attractive package is worthless, <laughs> you know. It's just nobody there, so why bother? And that's why they, the most beautiful people in the world, they bury them right away. You know, they don't keep them around. You know? Get rid of them. Yeah. You know? And then the true nature of the body begins to reveal itself. It breaks down quickly, starts stinking. You know, all that glow and beauty of the face be is gone. You know, the eyes that sparkled, windows to the soul, as they describe it, are no more. You know, and it's just blank stare. And yeah, there's nothing attractive there at all. To be honest, <laughs> and this is, you know, I'm, I'm raised in the north of Sweden in a, you know, quite, um, how to put it, I mean, in a nice, calm environment, peaceful environment. I've never seen to my knowledge, what I can remember, a dead person. I've never seen a dead body. I've, I've never seen a car with a dead body, body on it, in it. I've never been exposed in any way <laughs> to death, you know? Whoa. And I think that's the reality of a lot of people, you know? Wow. So it's, it's hard to relate to in a sense because I, I can only, you know, know from what I'm reading, from what I'm hearing, but I've never, it's not a reality that has been in any way introduced to me indirect experience. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, you know, I have <laughs> on a lot of occasions, both the death of, death of people in human bodies. I was a hunter for many years growing up, and I, would, I, I experienced death in squirrels and rabbits and ducks and geese and, you know, quail and doves and all kinds of living entities that I shot. And when I arrived at their body, at where they were, you know, they weren't dead. Most hunters don't kill things when they shoot them. They wound them. And then you have to execute that person in that whatever animal body it is upon arrival. So you shoot a squirrel. He falls out of the tree. You go over to pick that squirrel up. He's not dead. He's trying to run away. He's got broken leg or whatever his, his, you know, damage is, but he's there completely, and he's in fear, he's in shock, and you got to pick that squirrel up and kill him with your hands, you know, by banging his head against a tree or whatever your method may be, you see. And you see the moment that person in that squirrel body leaves. You're looking at that squirrel's eyes, and all of a sudden, there's nobody home, you know. Then, you know, okay, now I can put him in my coat and continue to hunt. You see, I mean, it sounds really gruesome, and it is. But again, when you're in a certain consciousness, it doesn't even phase you. You know, your heart is so hard, and your, you know, your mercy and compassion is zero, you know, and it's just a squirrel, it's nobody, it's not a person, and, you know, and you go home and take that squirrel and take his clothes off, Skin him and cut him up and put him in the pot and eat him. And you think, well, you don't think. You don't think anything. It's just what you do. You know, that's how hard-hearted it can be. You know, and people have this special deal about humans. But humans, yeah, it's a, it's a highly evolved, you know, form of life. But, you know, all these lower forms of life suffer too. You know, the cows that people slaughter by the millions every day, they're suffering greatly, you know. And people just enjoy their bodies. Oh, a good burger. See, so we become so conditioned and so hardened that, that it's unbelievable, you know. And even the religions of the world, they don't talk about the lower forms of life. They're talking about humans. Oh, you'll go to heaven. But they don't talking about what's a dog going to do when he dies, you know? How are you going to help that dog before he leaves his body? How are you going to help that horse or the cow 
or the cat that you love so much? What are you going to do for that guy? You know, and it basically they don't know anything, you know, and it, it is so selective. You don't eat your dog, but you eat the cow, you know. I, I, I was just thinking about a story. I, I remember <laughs> about a dog. There was a, I, I went to New Zealand to study to, uh, to an exchange period when I was 18. And the family I was, there was a host family that took me there or that, that hosted me that I was living with. And they were a bit alternative, you could say, quite alternative, I guess, because they, um, in their living room, there was a, there was a normal mat. And, and in this sort of the coziest part of the living room, there was a very special mat and it looked like some kind of animal. And I asked them, you know, is this, what, what's the thing? And I said, yeah, it's our old dog. <laughs> <laughs> that was their old dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So they, you know, he died. So they wanted to keep the memories of him and keep remembering him. So they took his skin off and put him on the floor and he's still there. Wow. Yeah. You know. No problem. But it's cheaper now. They don't have to feed him. <laughs> 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 and he doesn't bark at night and keep him up. And they don't have to take him for a walk. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. You, can. <laughs> you know, Ruben, you sent me this, uh, this video about uh, surviving death, you know, that little trailer thing. It's a Netflix thing. And I just watched the trailer just now, a few minutes ago. And I can see from what I saw in the trailer that people have no idea about life. They have no idea about death, you know. It's becoming, you know, more and more acceptable or people are more and more curious about what happens after death you know where do you go or you know is there really life after death uh oh i saw him he spoke to me like a loved one died and they saw this person again you know and, and he was in the room and or communicating with them in some way in a dream or whatever and and it's just like but what? I don't know. You know, I have these experiences, even out-of-body experiences. You know, when mm. people, you know, usually under severe stress or trauma or whatever, leave their body often on an operating table or in the ICU unit in the hospital. And they're out of their body, you know, and they're looking back at the doctors and nurses trying to bring them back to life, you know, all the, you know, the... Uh, monitors are flatlined and so on. And and they just watch this, you know, from the top of the room or wherever. And then it, they usually almost always come back into the body due to attachment and, you know, feeling of obligation to kids or whatever. And so they come back to life, so to speak, you know. And so now they've had a profound experience, you know, but they don't know what to do with that experience. You know, okay, so I left my body. I was still me. Now I'm back in my body. I know I'm not this body, but now what? You know, where to go from here? And unfortunately, there's so little authorized knowledge and information about this <clears throat> that it just winds up a bunch of speculation. You know, well, I think this, another guy thinks that. And, you know, nobody has any real information about these truths. I mean, in the yoga teaching, you know, I study and practice bhakti yoga. I have been like, like you said, for many, many years. I have my spiritual teachers who are, you know, expert in all subjects of life. And they have taught me. I have also, of course you know, as many people have, had my personal experiences. And so you take a personal experience, or if you don't have it, it's not critical, it doesn't matter. But if you have, you take that, combine it with, you know, this ancient eternal knowledge, and things start making sense. Oh, yeah, right, you know, now I understand, see. And so this is this is what we need. We need more real information about this subject that everybody has to deal with. And then for those who don't know, this Surviving Death is a new documentary. It was just released uh, in the beginning of January this year, a six-part 
series. And uh, yeah, well, w one of the things they said, <laughs> there's a lady who has who had such a near death experience, uh, Malakia, and she's she. They say she felt her spirit peel away from her body and travel up to brilliantly colorful, colorful flowerly heaven where time and space shifted. Is that what death is like? Well, you know, death is different for every individual, you know, and not everybody experiences that. And she didn't really go to the spiritual world. She went to a, another dimension of the astral world. The astral world is just a parallel world to this physical world. And so just like in this physical world, there's heavenly places where things are really nice, like Hawaii, you know, or Thailand or somewhere. And then there's really, really difficult places, you know, hellish places, if you want to call it, where it's, you know, poverty or it's war-torn or it's, you know, extreme cold or, you know, whatever the, the situation is that makes it very hellish. And you could go either one. And there's many, many levels in between the heaven and the hell that I just referred to, physically speaking. So you leave your body, and according to your karma and your desires and your attachments and so on, you're going to go wherever you go. So, you know, this is a good example of this is, is people who used to, and still do, of course, take psychedelic drugs, which induces basically also a similar situation where you can leave your body. But you're still covered by your subtle body, your astral body. Hmm? And so now you are in the astral plane. And so why is it that one guy took LSD, and he had a most amazing experience like this lady. Oh, I saw the most amazing, warm, beautiful light, you know, and I was just attracted to it like a moth into a flame. And I felt such love, you know, and compassion. And maybe that same guy next week took the same psychedelic drug, and he went to a horror show, you know, where there were people, you know, biting on his body and you know, ghoulish-looking people like the orcs right out of you know, the Lord of the Rings or whatever, you know, and he's screaming. And, you you know, you could see people on one trip, so to speak, and they're just smiling and happy and just floating. And the next time, you know, they're on another trip and they're screaming and crying and crawling under couches and whatever because they went to a different place. You know, they just went to another place, and that's who they met there. So, mm. you know, th these people don't always go. The, 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 the astral dimension is varied, you know. That's where people, disembodied souls live, people who don't have physical bodies but have, you know, only the mental covering. That's what ghosts are, you know. And so you may meet, you know, friendly ghosts, Casper the ghost, or you might meet, you know, the ghost of, you know, hell, where he's just like so angry and just wants to hurt you. You know, he's envious, you know, and he's not happy. And so all of this is just an, another understanding of where a person can go after death. But eventually the person will get another gross material body and come into another physical form, you see. Sometimes we have to work out reactions from past activities on the astral plane. Maybe we're destined to have a certain amount of suffering on the astral plane or some pleasure. And then we go into a physical body, enter into somebody's womb or into a seed of a plant or wherever we, whatever body we are put into, you know, and take... And that's linked to the karma that you spoke about? Yeah, yeah. And then you take another birth, you know. And there you are in another quote, life. You know, it's not another life, it's just a continuation of the eternal life of the soul in a different situation, you know. 
So when people sometimes ask me, where are you from? You know, the real answer is, well, this time around, I'm from America. You know, in other words, this is where I took my birth this time in a human form. You know, last time, I don't know. Next time, I don't know. But I know now I was born in a human body and in a certain town and a certain country, you know, to a certain mother and a certain father and so on, all according to my karma. And it's also connected with desires and, and you know, so on. So that's, that's how the yoga philosophy presents these truths, you know. And if we can just drop all our preconceived notions and prejudices and opinions and, you know, whatever, and just become open to the truth, then we can begin to learn things. But if with a person who, I say something and you say, no, that's not true, then I have no chance of teaching you anything because you already know everything. I can't teach anything to anybody who knows everything. You see? So we have to approach the absolute truth with an empty cup. You know? It's just like one uh, person came to this great yogi. And he says, oh, Master, I want you to, to teach me. You know, I want you to be my guru. But this, you know, yoga master, he could understand. This guy's so full of himself, and he thinks he knows everything. So he said, okay, but first let's have a cup of tea. So, said, oh, let's have the tea. So they sit down, and he gives this, you know, prospective student a cup. And he takes the teapot, and he just starts to fill the cup, and the cup fills up, and it just keeps pouring, and the cup is, is full, and the, the tea is pouring over and onto the guy's lap and on the floor. He said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, why, why do you keep pouring the tea? Can't you see my cup is full? He said, yes, that's exactly right. I can see your cup is full, just like this teacup. You're already full. I can't add anything to what you already know. You already know everything, you know. You have to approach the, the, the teacher with an empty cup. Then you can receive the truth. You know? So again, too many of us think we know everything. You know? I, guess when it, this, uh, I guess when it comes to death, we have to, or we, sooner or later, we realize that we know little, very little. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and death is inevitable, you know. It's stated in our main scripture we study in uh, Bhakti Yoga, Bhagavad Gita. See, and we only study the edition Bhagavad Gita as it is. You know, in fact, I have one right here. I could just let the viewers look at just so if you ever wanted to get the Bhagavad Gita, make sure you get this one because it's fully authorized. There's no opinions injected. There's no you know, deletions and, and so on. And we have that available as well, if anyone wants to. Oh, okay, yeah. So, great. So, anyway, in this uh, book of knowledge, Bhagavad Gita, it says, for one who is born, death is certain. And for one who dies, birth is certain. See? So, if you're born, you're going to die. If you die, you're going to be reborn. And that's, that's guaranteed. The soul is eternal. There is no death for the soul. Also, Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter. Both of these quotes are from the second chapter. Uh, second chapter, 20th verse. You know, it stated that for the soul, there's neither birth nor death. For the soul. See? For the soul, there's neither birth nor death. Nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. The soul is eternal, ever existing primeval, unchangeable, undying. The soul is not slain when the body is slain. So that's why Socrates said, catch me if you can kind of thing. You know, I'm going to die. I'm going to leave this body. You can do whatever you want to with the body, but I'm gone. I'm not there. <laughs> and so, you know, and that's that's... Another, there's another statement that said, death, where is thy sting? 
You know, that's a famous saying. From the, from the Bible. Yeah, because the sting of death is when the loved ones, you know, have lost the one they love, so they're stung by the loss of their loved ones, you see. But for that person, he's gone. You know, there's, there's nobody there. He's gone on to another experience. It may be good, may be bad, depends on what he did in this lifetime. You know? But is that the same thing as saying that you know, some people, a lot of people say, I think, as a way to deal with death, that death is just a part of life and death is natural? Yeah, but they don't have any idea what they're saying. They're just saying something. What do you mean death is a part of life? You you if you quiz these people, most of them will come up short in the answer, you know. What is part of life? See, life is eternal. Do they know that? Maybe, maybe not, you know. But, you know, death is just when the soul leaves one body, you know. And birth is when the soul enters another body. For the soul, there's neither birth nor death. See, he's just changing clothes. And again, that's another statement from Bhagavad Gita, you see, that, that you know, as the person you know, takes off old and useless clothes, putting on new ones. In the same way, the soul takes off old and useless clothes, the material body, and puts on a new one, you know. So the, the body is, and both bodies actually, are like clothes. You take off an old worn out pair of clothes and you put on a new pair, same with the body, you know. And it, the bodies do get old and they do die, <laughs> you know. They get worn out, you know. And people start feeling like that when they get elderly. You know, I'm just worn out, you know. But they're not worn out. The body's worn out. So, hmm. so the, uh, the inevitable is. So in the yoga teaching, after, you know, emphasizing all these truths, Okay, you're not the body, you're not the mind, you know, the body's going to die, but you're not going to die, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. See, instilling all those absolute facts, then the emphasis must shift. Okay, what should I do now in this life, which I am in now, this present situation in my body and now we're talking about a soul in a human body. What should I be doing now to prepare for this inevitable event? See, what should I be doing now so when I do leave my body, it'll I'll be prepared for that. I'm not <coughs> excuse me. I'm not going to be gripped with fear. I'm not going into some unknown that, you know, is just like the most frightening thing of all, thrown into the abyss kind of thing. I'm prepared. I understand the subject. I know what's going down. I know I, the spirit soul, which I have become in touch with through my practice and my education, am going to have to leave this body and go into a future existence. We'll call it a life just for you know, making it easy for people to understand. I have to go into another life, meaning another situation. So, of course, we all want the best, right, for ourselves, you know. That's what we're always trying to do, arrange things for the better, you know, a better job, a better, you know, person in my life that I love, a better, you know, education, a better financial situation, whatever. I'm trying to improve my life, hmm? meaning I'm trying to get it so I'm enjoying more. Life is more comfortable, more satisfying. I'm happier. I'm more peaceful. You know, I'm more successful, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? That's normal. That's the soul's nature. See, a dog's doing the same thing. It's looking for a better life, a softer bed, you know, nicer food to eat, you know, more freedom to run out and play in the woods or do whatever the dog wants to do. He's looking for the same thing, you know, just a better dog life. Hmm? So we're looking for better life. So 
you know, a wise person's going to think, well, what can I do now to make it so I'll have a better situation after death? I'll go to a better life. Hmm? And again, our Vedic Bhakti Yoga knowledge gives us unlimited information on that, you see. So the Vedic viewpoint is the soul who has taken birth in a human form of life has now entered school. And the school he has entered into is the school of life. And he is going to have to learn now how to live life properly, see? He's got to become educated. He's got to become practiced in applying the education to his life. Therefore, what he's doing his whole life, if he's, he's, he's intelligent, if he's acting correctly, is preparing for the graduation. Just like if you go to university. From day one, if you're a serious student, you're preparing for the final exam. Along the way, there's many little exams. There's exams for the physics course, and there's exams for, you know, the comparative anatomy course or the math or whatever you're taking, you know, your engineering or your IT course, whatever. There's little exams along the way, but the final exam is the big one. And there is where it's determined, are you going to graduate, get a degree, or are you going to fail? And you've got to go back and repeat the course, you see. So the, the death of the body is that final exam. Are we prepared for that exam? Now, you've been to university and so have I. And in any given course or the final exam, either one, if you have studied regularly, consistently, sincerely throughout the term, when it's time for the exam, you're ready for it. It's not like the last night or the two nights before the exam, you got to learn, you know, six months or a year of the course, cramming it in, trying to memorize and memorize and staying up late and drinking coffee. And, you know, you, when you get to the exam, you're so beat up, you can't even take it, you know. No, it's not like that. You're ready for it. But if you haven't done that, you partied, you had a good time, you know, every weekend you went out and just enjoyed yourself. The nights when you should have been studying, you were with your girlfriend or you were with the guys at the bar or whatever. And then the final exam comes. You're in panic. You're in panic mode, but hey, it's too late, man. You can't do it. It's too late, you see. So you're in fear, you go in there, you can't even think straight, you know, and, and you've got this gut feeling that, you know, I screwed up, <laughs> whatever. But you can't rewind it, now's the day, you've got to take the exam. So when we approach death, that's the final exam. If you've prepared along the way, you know, you're ready for it. You understand the subject, you know, and yeah, you just enter into that moment and go through it, and you come out the other side, and you're now going to have a very nice result because you're prepared, you see. And if you're prepared really well under the guidance of a true spiritual master, you don't have to take another material birth ever, see, ever. You've done your time in the material world through millions of lifetimes, through millions of different bodies, through millions of different deaths and rebirths. Okay? Now you finish with that because you're a good student. You prepared really, really well, you know. And what did you prepare? You prepared your relationship with the Supreme Lord. You worked on that. You cultivated that. You actually made that your focal point in life. You began to cooperate with the desires of the Lord. You developed a real relationship. And therefore, that love, that relationship, that attachment, you know, has become your life. That's your new life. That's your consciousness. That's your heart, you see. And along the way, 
all the karma from all the previous lifetimes and whatever you may have done in this lifetime before entering into this, you know, arena of life, all that karma has been burned up, you know, removed. It's been purified, you know, due to your contact with the purifying effect of God, His love, His mercy, your service, your devotion. All that has burned up all your previous karma, you see. So therefore, now you're free. You're actually free. This is freedom, see. You're free from the chains of attachment, from the entanglement and bonds of karma. Your desires have been completely redirected from I am the Lord to I want to be with the one I love, you know, to serve the one I love, you know. His pleasure is my pleasure. All that is the nature of the soul. That's the real nature of the soul. You become not a different person, but a new person, consciously speaking, a new consciousness. You've developed a whole nother dimension of consciousness. And that qualifies you to go back to the spiritual world, which is our real home, you see. And there you are again in your real condition of life. All these births and deaths in the material world through unlimited lifetimes. It's, it's, since, it's described as since time immemorable we've been here because nobody can trace it back, you see. And, you know, all that, you've already done it and you've learned what should have been learned you cultivated what should have been cultivated. Your consciousness is now purified. Your heart is purified. And, yeah, now you're a candidate. Not a candidate. You're actually uh, a qualified person to be a resident of the spiritual world. See? That's graduation on the highest level. That's real graduation. You see, and that's where the real happiness is. That's where the real bliss is. All the things we were always looking for here, that's where it is. Why do we look for these things? Because it's natural for the soul. But where is it to be found? In that loving relationship with the Lord and in his abode, see. And that's what we're missing by all this denial of religion and denial of God and denial of our true identity and denial of anything spiritual. That's what we're, we're going to miss completely because that hedonistic, materialistic philosophy is a guarantee that we will not achieve this goal. We will not graduate. We will fail again and again and again and again and again and suffer birth, disease, old age, and death repeatedly. <laughs> that's, that's scary. It's not scary. It's not scary. It's stupid. There's a difference. Why is it scary? Because it's only scary if we're determined to follow that route. You see? There's an alternative. It's scary if we don't take the other path. See? That's where the fear is that we're going to not take the path that will lead to true happiness and true satisfaction. You know, this philosophy is not scary. It's the choice we make that's scary. You see, that's where the fear is. But what are we afraid of? We should examine what am I afraid of? See, why am I afraid to enter into this path of light? Why am I more comfortable on the path of darkness than even contemplating the path of light? Why? Because of ignorance, complete ignorance, completely overtaken by, by ignorance, dense darkness, lust, 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 lust. See, they compare in the uh, uh, Chaitanya Church Amrita, another one of our Vedic scriptures, that lust is like dense darkness, and love is light, effulgent light, see, but we prefer the dense darkness, you know. And 
Okay, that's what you prefer. That's what you can have. And so we do. We have it, you know. We fill our lives up with darkness. And we wonder why everything's so dark. <laughs> you know. I, I'm looking back to, again, the dog. <laughs> your, your mention of dog. I, so what do we do? When, what do we do for a living being that's in a dog body? To help him. You mentioned the dog before. Yeah. What do we do? We understand, number one, we have to understand, here's a person. This is not a dog. This is a person. This is a spirit soul, just like I'm a spirit soul. This is a, a, a true spiritual relative of mine, a brother, whatever you want to call it, brother, sister, you know, member of the same family. Okay, because there's only one Father, and that's the Supreme Lord. See, He says, I am the Supreme Father of all living entities. You know, I am the life-giving Father. Okay, so, number one, here's this dog. All right, I look at this dog with this vision. Here's a person in this dog body. That person needs happiness and pleasure and spiritual truth and spiritual love as much as I do. I mean, we all need the same thing. But this person in this dog body is very, very handicapped. He doesn't have the facilities I have in the human body. You know, his consciousness is dog consciousness. He has a different mind. He has a different intelligence. You know, he's, he's ruled by instinct, basically. You know, I don't know how close you know dogs, but dogs are ruled by their nose and their tongue. All they do is sniff around and eat anything and everything, you know. I mean, it's just amazing. And then the little sex life they get when the neighbor's dog is in heat or they're the in heat and the neighbor's dogs come, you know. Other than that, that's their life, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. You know that. Okay, this dog's stuck, you know, and he's got to wait till he leaves the dog body and then by the natural evolution of the soul from lower forms of life to higher forms of life, he will move up a notch to a higher form of life than a dog body. And then from there, he'll go through another evolution to another body until eventually he gets a human body. But how long is that going to take? You see, we don't know. And he, so now I want to help this person because this person's going to die too. He's going to have to leave that body. So, in the Bhakti Yoga system, we've been given amazing facilities to help other people, not only ourselves. This is not a self-centered philosophy. This is a philosophy to help everybody, including the dog and the tree in all lower forms. So these mantras that we chant, you know, like we have a mantra, Goranga, that we chant. We do it in a deep breathing technique, kind of like, you know, many people for me were chanting Om. Om. So we use a similar technique, but we chant one of God's names, see, which is Goranga. And we divide it, Goranga. So we chant Goranga. Slowly, gently, breathing deeply, meditating on the sound. When we're inhaling, we chant the mantra in the mind, etc., Okay, And that brings me in contact with transcendental sound, spiritual sound, non-different than the Lord himself. This purifies me, the spirit soul. Okay, I take that same truth and make it so the dog hears the mantra. Goranga, Haribo. See, I say these transcendental sounds to the dog. The dog receives it through the dog ears. And it goes into the dog mind, but it goes further down into the dog's heart. What's in the dog's heart? The person, the spirit soul. What else is in the dog's heart? An expansion of the Lord in the heart of all living entities, known as Paramatma, the Lord in the heart. See, But the dog doesn't know any of this, and it doesn't chant, but it can hear. So I arrange it so the dog hears this transcendental sound. This purifies this person in this dog body. And when this dog leaves, when this person leaves its dog body, now that purification takes it to a human form of life. See? Or maybe beyond. 
That's not up to me. See? Or I can take the the food that I myself eat or others eat, you know, vegetarian food, I offer it to the Supreme Lord. There's, there's a way to do that. It's part of the bhakti yoga process. Teaching it to other people is what we do often. You take the food, offer it to the Supreme Lord. He accepts it because we try to offer it with love and devotion. Then that food becomes uh, saturated with spiritual potency, spiritual purifying energy. Okay? I give that to the dog. The dog eats it. That also purifies that person in that dog body, which is also going to take that person to a human form of life. See, now in the human form of life, that same person that just recently was in a dog body has a whole different opportunity. He's got a, a mind and intelligence that is far advanced. He can ask questions. He began to wonder about who am I. He can listen to this lecture and maybe get some of it. You see, he can, he can turn on his computer. See, the dog can't turn on a computer. Even if he could, he wouldn't know what he was looking at, see. But this now this same person is in a human body. He's got a computer. He turns it on. He tunes in to, you know, Ruben's channel. And here we go. He's hearing about death and how to prepare for it. You see, he's hearing. You're not the body. You used to be a dog. Now you're a human. You know, you can move on and become a true resident of the spiritual world in a spiritual form, not a material form. You see, this is your eternal form. He can hear these things, and maybe he can become interested and start pursuing this. You know, That's how you help a dog. Not by skinning them and laying them on the floor. <laughs> well, maybe they didn't. All this that you mentioned before, and then they put him on the floor. But yeah, but n knowing all this, what have what are your experiences of death? You you spoke before about your your father and mother, and you had a close relationship. I remember to your to your father. How was how did you handle that, or anyone else that you've had around you? Ah. Well, I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't actually present when my father left his body. You know, I wish I would have been, but I wasn't. But I had visited him, you know, recently, before that time. So I had given him some of the food that had been offered, as I just mentioned, called prasadam. You know, I gave him some special beads, that are Tulsi beads, you know, to put it around his neck. And which are also very protective. You know, I always wear mine at the time of death. They're, they're a protection. Uh, he was a, a very, very spiritual person. He, he followed the Christian teachings, but he was devout. I mean, he was not a charlatan. He didn't just go to church on Sunday and live the, you know, everyday non-Christian life the rest of the week. I mean, every moment of his life was connected to his following the teachings of Jesus, you know. He exemplified that in everything he did. But he wasn't a fanatic at all. He wasn't somebody going around grabbing people and preaching to them. He just lived every day in a way that he thought would be pleasing to Jesus, you know. Very kind, very compassionate, etc. So he was already a long ways down the road, you know, and he had a big influence on me because of just the way he lived. He didn't preach to me. You know, we went to church together, you know, but you just looked at this guy. You know, this guy is doing what he's doing because the Bible and Jesus say that's what he should do. You know, that really had a big impact on me, you know. So <clears throat> anyway, when he left his body, you know, I feel very, very uh, good that he had a very nice journey, you know. He was a personification of forgiveness, you know, which is, you know, the essence of love. Love for God is the essence, and the essence of love is forgiveness. And the last thing he said before he left his body, I'm so, I hope I didn't hurt anybody in this lifetime. 
I hope I didn't cause anybody any pain and difficulty. And if I did, I am so, so sorry. Please forgive me. You know, that was his last words. You know, this is where he was at. So he had a nice, he had a nice transition. You know, I don't know where he went, but I'm telling you, it was, you know, a good place. And then my mom, I was with my mom. And, you know, she wasn't as dedicated or devoted as my father was, but she also had strong religious beliefs, ties. And so, you know, I was able to, to be with her, and my sister was there too, also a strong follower of the teachings of Christianity. But we harmonized on helping my mom leave her body, my sister and I, you know. So again, the, the, the special beads for her to wear around the neck, you know, some holy water, uh, you know, different, different elements, let's say, that you can use to, to actually help this situation. And so I was playing the, the mantra chanting, you know, for days before she left her body, you know, like a week or two weeks before, you know, 24 hours a day. And uh, so that was also, you know, of great benefit. She was had a stroke. She was, you know, very far removed from the external world to a large degree. But she could hear and she could relate. And then... Uh, at the moment she left her body, I was chanting mantras in her ear. The mantras were playing. My sister was reading, you know, the Lord's Prayer from the Bible, you know, and she was on her way, you know. And she looked like an angel. I mean, she was 92 years old, and, you know, very few 92-year-old people look beautiful, physically speaking, you know. But somehow in that transition from the time she was in her body till the time she left her body. She looked like a young maiden. You know, don't ask me any details how it works. I don't know. But all I know is when, if I'd have walked in the room and looked out, I'd say, where's my mom? What happened to mom? Who is this? You know, and the nurses were coming in and they were saying, wow, so beautiful. You know, she was so, had such a look of peace and, and just contentment on her face. You know, it was, it was just amazing. You know, her hair completely changed. Everything changed, you know. So, yeah, that's how it was, and I was so happy, you know. It was an internal happiness that, that is just, you can't describe it. It's just a, a joy, a spiritual joy about death. There was no tears. It was like absolute joy. And my sister was the same. She was just like, wow, you know. So there you go, two, quote, religions, you know, my yoga teachings, my Christer's, sister's Christian teachings, my mom, you know, her Christian base, but all coming together in union. There was no Christianity. There was no yoga, this, yoga. It was all about love for God, you know. That's the harmonizer. That's where we should all meet. That's the common ground. Forget all these sectarian beliefs. You know, that's the problem. You know, no arguing about this is the right way, that's the right way. Don't do this, and we must do that. No, just come together, give the Lord as much as you can, ask the Lord to please protect this dear soul, and wow, amazing. See? That's harmony. And so everybody felt good. The nurses felt good. And there was another lady in that same room, there was a petition that divided her, it was in a hospital between my mom and this other elderly lady, it was a petition. And and I walked out after, you know, some time and went through her part of the room. And I said, oh, my mom just died. And she said, yeah, I know, I heard. It was beautiful. So, you know, death is not scary if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, it's the most horrific thing of all. They still leave you, though. You, you, it still hurts when you can't talk to them. You can't be with your father anymore, no? Well, it depends on how attached you were, you know? 
there's attachments and there's love. There's two different things here. It's not the same. Many people are emotionally attached, sentimentally attached to another person, you see, and that's what they miss. They miss that person in their life. And of course, <clears throat> you miss them. But on, if you're on a higher spiritual relationship, they're not gone. They're still with you, you know, because in the spiritual world, there's not, you know, coming and going. You're with that person. So these spiritual relationships are eternal. So I can talk about my mother right now in a different way than many people can talk about their deceased mother or father, you know, because she's not gone. And I feel so good that she's in a better place spiritually, you know, that, you know, maybe she's at home. I don't know. There's a good chance of it, but I'm not, a, I'm not God. I can't, you know, say that. But I know one thing, she's, she was well taken care of. That I know. You know, so what is there to miss? What, you'd rather have them here suffering old age and death, you know, rather than have them, if you love somebody, you want them in the best situation. You know, if you're selfish and attached, sentimental, you want them here with me. Be with me, you know. So it depends on your relationship. What are you missing? The pleasure that they gave you? Who's the, who's the enjoyer here? You know, I miss the pleasure they gave me. You know, the food they used to cook, the, you know, the, the warm vibes or, you know, how they, they treated me. Well, you, who's, the, who's the enjoyer here? You know, I'd rather have them here in this world of suffering than in the spiritual world where there's absolutely nothing but you know, called Ananda, spiritual bliss. That's selfishness. That's not love, you see. If you love somebody and you knew that, okay, here's the a, here's a situation. You love somebody, and a, and a true lover of God loves everybody. He doesn't just love mom and dad and sister and brother and wife and children. He loves everybody equally. You know, that's unconditional love. Okay, so... Let's say there's, you know, there's a, this is theoretical, of course. There's a time when you're going to die and someone beside you die. And there's an airplane coming to take you to heaven. And you already have a reservation. There's only one seat left. Everything else is occupied. And there's only one seat, but that's your seat. You got the ticket. You got the reservation. And here's the person beside you that has no reservation. If you really love that person, if you were on that true platform, you'd give that guy your ticket. Here, you get on the plane, you go. You know, that's, that's how you should understand real love. It's not about me. It's about, okay, this person, you know, I want you to go. That's what we're talking about. I remember that was, <laughs> this was one of the first times I was in the United States. I think I met you there. We were out doing some hiking and I remember we spoke about this. This was maybe five years ago. I, I, I felt that because what I heard was liberation is a goal. To get out of this miserable existence is a goal. And I wasn't satisfied with that. I didn't feel like that was... Or I came to realize that there must be something more. So I remember I was asking you, well, is that it? How about everyone else? <laughs> <laughs> All right, screw them. I'm going to go. You know, yeah. It's that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's about everybody else goes and then I'll take what I get, you know. <laughs> I'll take the next plane if somebody so, if it got room for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so. Wow. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big subject, you know. But the point that everybody should try to take away from this, you know, very informal conversation is prepare now. Now is the time. The Vedas have a statement. Now is the time to inquire into the absolute truth. You have a human form of life now. You may not have it again. Who knows for how long, you know. There's no guarantee you're going to get another human form. That's another illusion that everybody that's a human, next birth, they're going to be another human, you know. But who said that? 
the wishful thinkers, the people who have no real understanding. Most people don't get another human form. They go down again into some lower form of life and then have to cycle through many, many, you know, lifetimes of birth, death, old age, and disease to eventually, somewhere, get another human birth, you see. And then who knows what we'll do with that one. But now we have it. So we should use it for what it's intended for. That's the whole purpose of the human form of life, see, spiritual realization. That's the purpose of the human form of life. It is not to enjoy the world. If you want to enjoy the world, the human body is the worst one. The worst one to enjoy the world. Look at the dog. You know, what is, what is plaguing us in human bodies who are trying to enjoy the world? Anxiety, I'm not going to be successful. I'm not getting as much as I want. I'm never really satisfied. Oh, I'm getting old. I can't enjoy as much as I used to. Oh, I want somebody to love me. I want this one, but they don't love me. I'm always in anxiety that if I found somebody, they're going to leave me. I'm not as attractive as I used to be. And then all the other just nuts and bolts, like how am I going to pay the rent? You know, oh, I crashed my car. I can't afford to get it fixed. You know, I got to pay the insurance. And oh, my kids, I got kids, and, and they're just going crazy and you know, every day they cost me more money and they don't listen to what I say. And, you know, my my son's in trouble with the law and I got to go deal with that. And, you know, oh, and my, you know, wife is, you know, got cancer. And, oh, now it's COVID-19 and I'm afraid I'm going to get it. And I got to wear a mask, but I don't want to. And I hate lockdowns. And, you know, you think dogs worry about any of that stuff? Zero. Everything I mentioned and millions of other things dogs don't even know about. You know, we got two dogs here at the house. Yogi dog is one. <laughs> <laughs> and Yogi dog's daughter, Grumpy. Grumpy's, you know, indicative of her mood. She's a little bit grumpy. <laughs> you know, she's getting better, though. She's heard a lot of chanting at a lot of prasadam. She's, she's getting not so grumpy. You know, but they don't worry about any of that stuff. Oh, winter's coming. Oh, we got to make sure the heat works right, and I got to get different clothes, and my shoes don't work. They're not warm enough, and you know, they don't buy clothes. You know, she's got a gimp leg. Yogi dog's got a gimp leg. She's thinking, oh, I'm feeling so lowly. I I got a gimp leg. Nobody's gonna love me. You know, she's out just cruising, man, with her gimp leg. You know, she could care less, you know. So if you want to enjoy the world, you know, they eat anything. I won't even mention some things they eat, you know. They, if you want to talk about enjoying the world, a human form is not the right form for that, you know. It's not the right form. It's just a form filled with the anxieties and depressions. I never seen a dog commit suicide, never. And I've been around dogs my whole life. I never seen dogs sitting in the corner won't come out, you know. Although if they've been beaten and ill-treated by humans, it does affect them psychologically, absolutely, you know. But in general, dog life is, is a cool life, you know. But it's not a cool life for the soul because... They're ignorant of truth, and they can't learn truth. So if somebody that knows truth can come along and fast-forward them into the human form of life, and then hopefully they'll use it for its intention of, of developing spiritual knowledge. You know, But at least they've got the opportunity, whereas in a dog body they don't. See? I think this is, a, no, this is this perfect topic for the next time, I think, enjoyment. Yeah, let's talk about enjoyment, man. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, do, <laughs> do, do we have time, Slava, for five-minute kirtan? Can we, can we chant a little bit? Uh, yeah, we do have time, actually. Mm -hmm. Slava says, maybe, may not, but yeah, we do. We will take it. Let's say it that way. We'll take the time. <laughs> you know, everybody has time if we take it.
I mean, do you have time to die? <laughs> I don't have time to die, but you die anyway. And the world goes on, right? Okay, so we're going to do a meditation with music. The mantra is Goranga Haribo. That's all simple. Goranga Haribo. Mantras, transcendental sounds. Everybody. Meditation we call Sankratan. So if Yogi Dog was listening, she got some purification. <laughs> <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> yeah, man. That's how you do it. Mm. Yeah, so you know, if you know the truth, if you if you prepare for death, then death has no sting. You know. Death, where is your sting? 
You're not stung with fear. You're not stung with anxiety. You're not stung with, you know, you know, panic, really. You know, you just transition. You go into it. It's just another part of life. You're ready for it. And so there you go. No sting. Death has no sting for the wise. Thank you, Valakia. Oh. Okay, Ruben, that's all I got time for. I got to, to get on to another program. <laughs> <laughs> Busy schedule. Yeah, yeah, but it's great. You know, you know. Busy is good when busy is what you want to do. Yeah, the, the soul is always active. So if we're active, you know, in the way we should be active, then life is a joy. Happy man. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we'll see you next time for, what you say, pleasure? Is that what you said? Well, I said enjoyment, but I th we'll see if it's going to be that. Or we have something about Buddhism as well that we might want to cover. We'll, we'll oh, see. yeah, we got to, yeah, yeah, somebody asked us about that. Yeah, that's a good one too. Because, you know, we need to, to know all different aspects of, you know, things that are coming up in life, you know, so this is a this is a good one. Yeah, we'll do that one next and then we can do the other ones later. We got many. We got, we got time. You know, we got time till we don't, so let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh. All the best to all the folks there. Namaste. So that's all we had for today. Thank you so much for joining and do share this link to the this episode to anyone you think would benefit from that. If you have any questions, do join the Facebook group, uh, our private Facebook group. Link is in the episode description. And to get email updates, we encourage you to go to breakingtrail.life, where our website where you can sign up for the email lists and get updates on upcoming upcoming episodes. See you soon again, stay true to yourself and dare to break trail.